Hey, uh, Deputy Managing Director of the IMF, uh, Anand Nageswaran, Chief Economic Advisor, India, um, Nandala Virasanke, Governor, Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Samsul Alam, uh, Minister of State, Bangladesh, and uh, Mahaprasad Adhikari, Governor, Nepal, uh, Rastra Bank. Uh, I now hand it over to Krishna to begin the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Pragyan. Um, again, um, good afternoon to everyone here. To this high-level policy panel on strengthening institutions for sustainable growth in the post-COVID world. Uh, again, uh, just to highlight some facts from the book, which was launched today. Uh, in the period preceding the pandemic, there was a marked decrease in poverty globally, but notably in South Asia. In fact, if you put the five countries together, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, and Sri Lanka, uh, extreme poverty decreased from 500 million to less than 250 million. Per capita incomes more than doubled in real terms, and the region uh, share of global GDP grew from less than 5% in 2000 to more than 8% in 2019. Going beyond numbers, if you look at any metric of healthcare, education access, and so on, internet access to the internet, everything improved significantly. But then COVID struck, and we've had since COVID back-to-back -back crisis, the war, the cost of living crisis, and so on, and all these have dealt a serious blow to growth and poverty reduction. And there's been a significant increase in people living in extreme poverty. And some of the pre-pandemic vulnerabilities have been exacerbated. For example, uh, as the governor quoted this morning, debt levels have risen sharply. So overcoming uh, these challenges and meeting SDG goals will require serious reform efforts across all countries. In some sense, this is a strength, central theme of the book. So um, in today's panel, we'll start off with uh, uh, DMD Antony Tsai, highlighting some key messages from the book, uh, which could then set the stage for a discussion of what transpires after that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Krishna. Um, so as I mentioned this morning, um, sorry, this doesn't work, I guess. OK. As I, <laughs> I'm not sure. OK. No, as I mentioned this morning in my, in my uh, opening remarks, uh, the book uh, draws lessons uh, uh, from uh, South Asia's own uh, 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 history, as well as from cross-country comparisons with its peers. And uh, the central question also underscored uh, this morning is how South Asia uh, can return to the growth rates of the past two decades and resume the momentum of poverty reduction that uh, Krishna has just described um, in, in this post-COVID uh, 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 era. So, and uh, you know, how, how this can be done in a way that achieves uh, equitable and climate friendly uh, growth and without a renewed buildup of uh, macroeconomic vulnerabilities, we're seeing uh, significant vulnerabilities already. And uh, several chapters of the book uh, then take a longer term perspective and draw lessons from South, Africa, uh, South Asia's uh, development experience uh, over the past decades, uh, coming, uh, uh, giving us three main uh, important lessons. The first one is that strong, evi uh, very strong evidence uh, uh, in the book that sustained growth is indeed essential for poverty reduction, no question about that. Um, the second lesson uh, is that um, you know, growth accelerations experienced in, in, um, uh, in, in South Asia came in the wake, uh, came after the pursuit of uh, important reforms. And third, that reforms in South Asia were typically less, uh, less profound than in other parts of Asia. And uh, that in recent uh, time, the reform momentum has actually uh, slowed down. Um, and so the book then goes on to draw out uh, uh, several structural constraints uh, to growth that uh, then need to be addressed. Trade barriers being, remaining high being one of them, uh, government uh, Governments exercising a large role still in the uh, in in economic activity, and uh, incumbent existing firms then having less of an uh, uh, fewer incentives to be innovative, to diversify, to become uh, 
uh, more competitive in the new export uh, markets. So as a result, uh, South Asia struggles with uh, providing employment to its uh, youth, and many of them are uh, consequently migrating elsewhere instead of contributing to South Asia's own, own development. So reforms are clearly needed to, uh, to unlock uh, South Asia's uh, full potential. Uh, they cover three broad uh, areas that I also touched on this morning, the first being that policies that uh, support uh, growth, in, uh, inclusive growth, uh, sustainable and resilient growth, including to climate uh, change, uh, certainly need to be pursued. Um, second is that uh, fostering trade uh, trade and uh, global, fin uh, global value chain integration, uh, very important, uh, that ref uh, ref and the, the reforms, of course, that go along with that. And the third is the overarching role of macro, macro financial management, better ma macro financial management. So those are the key uh, lessons and themes, I think, and the directions for reform that the, the book uh, spells out. Uh, thanks, Antony. Uh, I'm going to uh, start off with asking questions to uh, uh, Mr. Nageshwaran because he has to leave at 5.30, so we're going to optimize on our time here. Let me ask you a, a very specific question. Uh, Antony talked about structural uh, impediments. So from the Indian perspective, what are some of the key structural and institutional impediments that policymakers need to focus on to ensure strong and inclusive growth uh, going forward? Okay. Uh, thank you, Krishna. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you know, uh, Krishna's question is about structural impediments for strong and inclusive, sustainable growth. And also the topic of this session is about institutions. So I think they kind of overlap. Uh, normally, when we think of uh, institutional framework to ensure sustainable and inclusive growth, we think of uh, fiscal policy frameworks monetary policy framework consisting of an independent central bank, uh, inflation targeting regime, and then autonomous regulatory bodies to regulate uh, public utilities or other monopolies, and of course, uh, independent judiciary, etc. But when we talk of the Indian context, most of these things are present. Not, may, may not be fully, may not be to the extent that some people would be hoping for, but we have most of these boxes are ticked in the Indian context. Um, of course, you can talk about uh, absence of a fiscal policy framework at uh, lower government levels, et cetera. But nonetheless, uh, there are uh, fiscal rules, both for the union government and for the state governments. Uh, the Bank of India oversees some of them, et cetera. And there are automatic checks and balances as well. So these standard uh, frameworks are more or less in place. Then what are the other structural impediments? So I would say I would speak again first initially from the angle of uh, state capacity. So one of the things that we notice uh, is that in general, across uh, union and state governments, et cetera, at the policy making level, contrary to public perception that governments are overstaffed, et cetera, I would even argue that at the higher echelons, we need more people rather than less. Uh, because many people, uh, many of the senior levels of bureaucracy actually are uh, burning both ends of the candle in terms of the uh, amount of burden, workload that they carry, and therefore I think, uh, so one of the issues of state capacity is about actually strengthening the higher echelons of bureaucracy, and that is, in my, in my opinion, that's also an impediment. And the, the second thing I would argue is that uh, of course, and here again, the government of India has made a very strong beginning in the last few years. Uh, one of the ways in which you one uh, widens the perspectives and horizons is to also encourage wherever feasible and appropriate uh, lateral hiring, which the government of India has been doing in the last uh, uh, several years. But that can also uh, be done more in more areas where it is feasible, desirable, and even appropriate because it brings in fresh perspectives different thinking, and also ability for a fusion of good practices from the private sector to the public sector, and vice versa. And also it helps the uh, people coming from outside the government framework to understand how governments work and what are the things that they prioritize, uh, the process, uh, adherence to due processes, etc. So that will, it, is, it is something that will be synergistic and beneficial to both sides, and that needs to happen. Um, 
Apart from that, I would also argue that the other structural impediment is we need to make sure that project execution and implementation happen across government levels without uh, time and cost overruns. Because uh, to the extent that public sector is still very active in terms of uh, capital expenditure, especially in the last 10 years when, uh, by and large, the private sector and the financial system were undergoing balance sheet repair, and when you have the public sector, therefore, uh, taking the run, running with the baton of uh, leading capital investments, then you need to have the public sector being able to execute projects uh, with time and uh, without time and cost overruns. And therefore, the the uh, the process of on uh, time monitoring and uh, course corrections and implementation and sequencing, these are all I would say all the structural factors that need to be strengthened. I'll stop here. Uh, thanks, uh, Ms. Nageshwaran. Uh, let me just ask you one more question before I turn to the others. One of the areas where India did very well uh, in the context of the pandemic was on digitalization. And in some sense, uh, it was, it, it uh, reflected many things. It reflected public-private partnership. It reflected the fact that in the context of, uh, you know, economy slowing, we found a sector which could grow faster it could uh, help promote uh, growth in many areas which were previously uh, untouched. So what explains the success of India in, dig in digitalization? And what lessons does it offer to countries in uh, South Asia uh, in that front? No, that's, uh, uh, again, um, it's a question that probably requires another day of uh, uh, seminar <laughs> to, to go through. Uh, so I'll try to be brief. I think some of the foundations for this uh, digital infrastructure success were laid in the past. Obviously, uh, uh, in terms of the ecosystem, the, uh, the, the number of software engineers, etc. That apart, um, the financial inclusion project that the government of India undertook in 2015 and the biometric identity were two important pillars, which were also mentioned in the previous session. Uh, but other than that, what India did was to sort of uh, avoid over-reliance on either the public sector or the private sector to, to bring about this. It was a marriage of public sector processes and private sector initiative, public sector regulation and private sector innovation. Mm -hmm. Those were the ways in which this public digital infrastructure got built. And uh, some of the advantages of being relative late mover compared to advanced nations is to be able to avoid the mistakes that they made. And, uh, and one of them was to make sure that it didn't develop in a manner that was exclusionary in nature. It was inclusive because it, could, it has to cater to all wallets and all, all sizes. And therefore, that is why um, uh, it had to be open architecture, it had to be affordable, and it had to be uh, uh, accessible by all people, I, and including in uh, uh, remote locations where communication infrastructure may not be well advanced. So these were all the things that were kept in mind. And these are the aspects of India's public digital infrastructure rollout that would be extremely relevant to many other nations as well. Antoinette, if you could uh, maybe expand on what uh, Anand said, in terms of how you see digitalization being uh, a tool that countries, developing countries could use uh, to uh, anchor strong and inclusive growth. Well, certainly uh, learning from the pandemic, of course, and uh, uh, already efforts made by some countries, uh, learning from uh, countries like India, in, in rolling out their safety nets in a better way uh, that was more supportive of mitigating the impact of the shocks on, uh, on the poorest in their populations has, uh, of course, underscored the power of digitalization that can help countries do better in reaching uh, larger segments of their populations uh, uh, in, a, in a better way. So that, that, that's certainly one, uh, one lesson. On the, on the management of public finances, of course, uh, uh, a lot can be done uh, to, uh, to strengthen uh, revenue administration uh, using uh, more dig digital processes and to do better in revenue mobilization uh, from that. So uh, I think those, and of course that uh, then gives governments uh, the ability to expand the fiscal space they can use to address the needs of their poorer segments. Uh, so uh, the power both uh, uh, to, to expand uh, revenues uh, the better use of revenues, of course, to, to, to have uh, more uh, targeted social safety nets uh, that reach the poor uh, more effectively, I think are one of the, the lessons we take away uh, also from India and in, in how it was able to really uh, maximize 
it's already con it's considerable uh, digital capacity uh, to, to respond to the pandemic. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Minister uh, uh, Shabzul Alam, if I, could ask, if I could ask, in the case of Bangladesh, uh, you have, uh, you know, recently growth has slowed. Uh, has slowed. Uh, the question is, how do you see the Indian example of digitalization being a role model for countries in the region, or even broadly? How do you see the role of digitalization in Bangladesh? Uh, good afternoon to everyone, and thank you very much. <coughs> of course, uh, digitalization uh, would uh, help us in a big way, and we visualize it in our first prospective plan of Bangladesh uh, from 2010 to 2021. We uh, put the slogan as Digital Bangladesh. So, and in terms of development budget, we put huge investment in uh, development of uh, IT sector in that uh, way, I should say. We emphasize a lot in terms of policy. And uh, we know India has done very well in IT sector. And uh, we are also emphasizing a lot. We have at least 15,000 uh, outsource uh, business entrepreneurs in Bangladesh. So it's a big number, I think, and that uh, has been possible because of government inspiration. We established uh, uh, what we call um, IT training centers, uh, digital parks, and IT centers uh, at every school, secondary level. So we realized that it's a uh, potential sector for us to go with. So we emphasize as a whole the infrastructure sector in Bangladesh. So you know we had uh, entered the mega project, uh, uh, mega project uh, era in Bangladesh. We have 10, uh, ten big mega projects uh, we, ha we have been implementing. And one was Padma Breeze, uh, you know, uh, we already inaugurated in last June, and uh, we introduced metro train or sky train in Bangladesh already, and we will introduce uh, in the next month, or this end of this month or in the next month, uh, area, uh, a, a, a tunnel under the river Kornofuli. What I want to say, in terms of infrastructure building, we had a lot of inadequacy in infrastructure requirement, you know. We started building ports, seaports. Uh, we developed our uh, seaports, which are in operation now. We created a lot of ro uh, roads network. Uh, we made all the roads, uh, district roads, and you know, highways, four lanes, six lanes. So all that has been to meet the inadequacy of infrastructure and allowing economic growth to come up and allowing business entrepreneurs to go with businesses. So we emphasized the uh, uh, no, IT sector quite a bit, I should say. And last uh, year, last financial year, uh, in, the last, uh, in last June, we exported one, more than one billion uh, no, uh, on uh, IT services and IT-related no, service exports. Thank you. Uh, governor, from your perspective as a, as a central bank governor, how do you see digitalization uh, you know, helping countries in the region and elsewhere uh, trigger strong, durable, inclusive growth? I mean, one aspect, of course, is financial inclusion. But do you want to talk a little bit about how you see it from a central bank perspective? Yeah, obviously, uh, see, I mean, the great example is obviously what India has done, and we are trying to learn and, uh, you know, get the advantage uh, of this digitalization. Especially when it uh, comes to central bank, uh, there are two areas. One is the uh, payment settlement uh, mm -hmm. infrastructure and digitalization, uh, and making much more efficient payment uh, and settlement infrastructure that can go down to uh, the bottom of the, the pyramid uh, in terms of uh, delivering social safety nets and financial inclusion, and, and even more than the areas like, uh, for example, uh, paying taxes, 
you know, minimizing tax evasions and, and other customs, in revenue, uh, access to all these areas, basically. I think this is where digitalization can, can play a great role. In one of the issues, uh, I think key one uh, there is a digital ID is, is key one. I think this is where in Sri Lanka, what we are trying, we have, we are trying to uh, implement digitalization in, in financial sector, key one, especially given AML safety and new regulations. And uh, the national uh, digital ID and linking that uh, for the, uh, the, uh, the financial services is, is, I think, the game changer. Uh, that's where uh, we are. We have been a little late, and we are trying to implement. Them. Once we do that, that can be that can be the, the 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 very useful instrument that can link all the financial transactions. That will help financial inclusions and will help financial uh, the, the, the the literacy even and services to the all the areas, and that will improve obviously efficiency. Productivity that we are talking about in in the book, uh, we are, uh, talk a lot about digitalization and, and other area is obviously uh, central bank digital currency. That I think uh, we, we are not uh, uh, not there yet, but we, we are looking at carefully what RBI is doing, and that's where I think the next uh, phase of uh, you know kind of game change in terms of digitalization. One is a national like digital uh, ID and then application of that to all the areas of financial services as well as all government services, delivery of social safety net, all these things, plus the CBDC is, is a next level, I think, is where I, I see the value uh, of that uh, in terms of how you say it. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Uh, governor Adhikari, from your perspective as a Governor of Central Bank of uh, Nepal, how do you see uh, the role of digitalization yeah, thank you. <coughs> thank you, <coughs> Director Mr. Kishnan. Uh, <coughs> let me quickly take one minute time to extend my courtesy to take this opportunity. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank and congratulate uh, the entire team involved on this <coughs> outcome of the part two resilient uh, South Asian growth related documents. It's really, I guess, uh, very much useful a reference document for all of us. At the same time, I'd also like to thank uh, everyone who <coughs> joined here. Let me quickly mention about uh, Nepal's case, uh, the COVID. In fact, it was, uh, the first case was seen in January 2020. Uh, total number of uh, <coughs> death uh, uh, was around 12,019 so far. And total number of positive cases uh, detected is around 1 million. Thanks to Serum India, the regional, uh, this region is one of the main institute uh, that has produced uh, the vaccination and a while at the first instance to Nepal as well. And we are able to recover from the COVID in an early stage itself with their support. And I would like to extend my gratitude to all scientists and team involved on that on this occasion. Let me move towards our, our vaccination percentage is well above the global average. It's almost 95.7% of the more than 12 years <coughs> population. Let me move towards your question with respect to digitization. We consider it as one of the key means and instrument for the financial inclusion. It is also one of the key means for preventing money laundering like activities. It is also <coughs> the instrument for anti-corruption. It is also helpful promoting transparency. Ultimately, it improves the cashless society and improves governance into the society. If you see within this two and a half year of the COVID period, the, the progress in Nepal on the digitization is really remarkable. The growth, if you see, it's almost 300 percent of the of the many of the retail uh, value transaction, and even uh, RTGS, you can see the value of the transaction goes uh, that uh, significantly. Okay, so we are very much encouraged with the progress, um, and 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 we are looking forward to develop further uh, infrastructure on it, and also we are looking forward to have a cross-border 
uh, mechanism uh, with the sharing with the Indian India's uh, yeah huge infrastructure, mature infrastructure like uh, India UPI mm -hmm. with the Nepal's uh, related uh, private sector and uh, government uh, related um, yeah infrastructure, so that. Uh, the uh, what this morning or this afternoon we talk about the cross border that the tourism etc that will be further facilitated we take it positively we encourage a lot we promoted this digitization uh, during this uh, covid period uh, thank you so clearly this is a, a, a game changer for most countries and uh, in terms of securing uh, growth going forward both in, in terms of strong and inclusive growth uh, uh, there's, a, there's a lot to be learned, a uh, lot we can leverage digitalization. I, I'd like to uh, move to a different topic. Uh, we talked this morning about the whole issue of risks from uh, geoeconomic fragmentation. And, uh, you know, we have done some work at the IMF uh, on this, and clearly uh, there are risks. And we've, it, it, it all started with, one could say that, I mean, there's no starting point, but if you think of the, the trade war between the U.S. and China, starting from there, to what's happened during the war in Ukraine, you've seen the risks of fragmentation rising. So, so Anton, if I could just uh, ask you to speak a little bit about how you see this from a multilateral perspective, and then I, I want to hear from all the panelists on how they see that, uh, both in terms of the region, how you could mitigate the risks from a geographic fragmentation, and how could you actually avoid it completely uh, in terms of promoting multilateralism. So if you could just start off on that, uh, Anton, that'd be great. Yeah. No, thanks, Krishna. As I uh, sketched out this morning, in the, in, again, in the, in the opening remarks I made, of course, this is a, uh, the move towards fragmentation and the increased fragmentation we're seeing, uh, even you know, preceding the war in Ukraine, but certainly since then, uh, uh, is a, of significant concern, has to be, <laughs> to an institution like ours. And uh, we see ourselves as having a very important role in reminding the international community of the, 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 the great value of uh, uh, free trade uh, that has helped uh, many countries uh, to, to lift uh, millions out of poverty uh, in the course of the, the past uh, couple of decades, and as, as specifically in this region uh, where it has been uh, a, a key engine of growth and poverty reduction. So uh, we, we have to work with our member countries, of course, to. Uh, to, to find common ground in their trade uh, disputes. Uh, we understand that uh, uh, countries uh, uh, rightly have uh, concerns about uh, uh, security issues uh, where they, sometimes they uh, then uh, uh, proceed to, uh, to believe that trade restrictions may help mm -hmm. uh, them deal with those <coughs> issues. That certainly, uh, while, while valuing the, uh, the, the need to, 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 to ensure uh, safety and security for individual countries uh, is a very costly way of, of seeking security. And uh, I think some of our analytic work uh, increasingly, mm -hmm. uh, some of uh, what uh, uh, Krishna sketched out, uh, uh, not specifically addressing that issue, but certainly uh, making it very clear what the cost of uh, increased uh, fragmentation are to uh, the global economy uh, can, can go a significant way, I think, in, in finding ways to to resolve uh, crises. We've, we've turned uh, specific attention to more work in our institution on trade issues in, in, the, in the past uh, couple of years uh, with a view to, to also laying out some of uh, those, uh, the, those costs and the benefits and reminding uh, the world of those mm -hmm. benefits. Uh, uh, and I think uh, uh, we're certainly making progress in uh, convening our country authorities in the context of the discussions we've had during the, the spring and annual meetings of focusing on those areas where uh, they're, they're very clear, uh, clear, uh, 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 a clear uh, rationale for uh, resisting fragmentation and uh, doing better uh, on, 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 on trade issues. One of the things we've, uh, we've uh, also seen, of course, is that countries uh, very much recognize the need for um, uh, you know, global, uh, 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 for better work together on global public goods and to combat uh, climate change, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, we have made the case and uh, can continue to make uh, that clear that it is absolutely inconsistent uh, to think that you can collectively work on, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a threat like climate change while closing yourselves off 
from the rest of the world and uh, putting in place trade res restrictions. It is not a, a consistent way of addressing uh, a matter of, of uh, uh, global uh, interest. So those are some of the things that we can do to, to better highlight mm -hmm. the risk of fragmentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Nagrishan, how do you see the risks of geochemical fragmentation? Uh, are we overstating it? Uh, but if the risks are real, how do you see the region coping with that? Is it a challenge or an opportunity? Uh, uh, so if you could speak to that. I, I like your, the framing of your question, whether it is a challenge or an opportunity. I think that is somewhat realistic, actually. Um, I mean, this is sort of Friday evening, and I think I would like to leave the participants with something to chew on when they leave. So I'm going to take a philosophical stance. In general, uh, I think uh, countries and individuals also tend to be large-hearted when things are doing going well for them. Prosperity means trade integration, openness to immigration, openness to trade, everything happens automatically and people don't feel insecure. Uh, that applies to immigration as well as to trade, mm -hmm. actually. And uh, I mean, I, I used to live for 22 years in, um, in, in Singapore and uh, in 2011, uh, after the national elections there, uh, which, uh, was, which created a ripple in that country. Uh, attitudes towards uh, uh, immigration began to tighten and uh, uh, progressively higher thresholds and benchmarks and hurdle rates were established for allowing immigration, etc. And, and you're talking about a small open economy which naturally thrives on openness and, and, and there are circumstances which force them to think of imposing some restrictions for, for, for considerations that they find as quite legitimate. Mm -hmm. So my point is that these things do tend to come around in cycles whether we like it or not. There is no, I think, uh, universal uh, prescription that we can adopt. And that would be theoretically desirable, but I think practically infeasible. Uh, uh, the, the, the benefits of integration are better realized during times of fragmentation. Mm -hmm. And during times of integration, we realize its drawbacks as well. And that is, that is, an, that is, that is given. Between 1945 and 1970, you had uh, uh, government-led growth. And then from 80 to 2020, you had basically globalization and markets-led growth, etc. And this will, and then uh, the balance of power shifted between from labor to capital. Now it will, the pendulum will swing back. And along with that will come issues of fragmentation and national uh, uh, considerations in terms of immigration, etc. These are, in my opinion, inevitable cyclical processes which we can uh, sort of wring our hands about, but we can't do much about them. Um, so now coming to your question, whether uh, it is a challenge or an opportunity for this region, I would think by and large uh, with, with the nations represented here on the table, including uh, India, I would take it that this is an opportunity to, for them to uh, climb onto the global trade bandwagon, which they were not really part of earlier. Mm -hmm. And that needs them to upgrade their technology, their investment in research and development, and their, their, and their ability to think through their education system and preparing them for the future. All those things will actually provide them opportunities to grab market share. So when the pie is growing for everybody, then there is no need to worry about market share. Even if it is constant, you will benefit. But when the pie is not growing as big, or when there are countries looking at uh, national security angles other than efficiency angles, then it is about market share, which means focusing on competitiveness, focusing on uh, market share gains. And that, I think, is an opportunity for South Asian countries. And they should start with first trading a lot more among themselves in the first place. Since uh, you like my question, I'm going to pose a question to the minister. Uh, do you see this as an opportunity or a challenge? And do you see the risks of fragmentation uh, being heightened, being elevated at this, at this point in time? Thank you. Of course, uh, many more reforms are clearly needed, no doubt about that. And uh, there is a uh, need for value chains integration, uh, no, for accelerating trade and growth in this region. So why we have, uh, you know, uh, as you said, fragmentation? I think fragmentation is due to lack of co co coherence in macro policies 
among countries in this region and uh, particularly in South Asia. So if you see there is a, a variation in trade openness uh, of these countries. Uh, so trade to GDP ratio uh, is at different level uh, of these countries. That has arisen, I think, because of fragmentation. We have, no, we have variation in tax policies also. Tax policy is up until now, at least in Bangladesh, is uh, revenue oriented, not development oriented as I understand. So uh, there is a tax policy, you know, a variation in South Asian countries and uh, variation in tariffs and non-tariff, you know, uh, obstacles to trade and uh, variation in tax holidays. Particularly in Bangladesh, we have so many tax holidays. I mean, it's too many as I understand. Uh, it's my consideration. So there is variation in infrastructural facilities among these countries. Uh, why these variations arose? Because of uh, fragmentation in policy. As I earlier said, we lack policy coherence, particularly in you know, macroeconomic management. So uh, even standing institutions, you know, we need cooperation and uh, uh, one of the source of uh, fragmentation is, uh, no, uh, our uh, variations in macro policies. So all these really, you know, uh, results in uh, which country uh, can get how much FDIs, which country can have how much, you know, uh, exploit the uh, potential of uh, PPPs. How much uh, each country can use the FTAs and uh, uh, SEPAs, if I say, and how they can use special economic zones. So there is big variation in these countries within this small region. So this is because of uh, fragmentation. So you asked me whether it is opportunity or uh, no, uh, challenge. Uh, of course, uh, it appears a challenge, but uh, every challenge has, you know, uh, has potential opportunities also. And potential opportunities, I should say, there is uh, clear you know, uh, recognition of uh, more trade cooperation, more, uh, more, more you know, clear understanding of having, need to having more trade among this region. So in that sense, of course, this is uh, also opportunity to tap with. Thank you very much. So, so do you see, uh, I mean, Bangladesh has benefited a lot from trade. And uh, if you want to sustain that, do you see a strengthening of further, in, I mean, or greater integration within the region? Or do you see this as going beyond the region uh, to rest of Asia and the rest of the world? How do you see that? Well, in in both, you know, we need more uh, cooperation with the South Asian regions, particularly, I should say, India, Nepal, mm -hmm. Bhutan, Sri Lanka as they are very much, you know, neighboring with us and have more trade relations with them. So this is uh, in one side. Other side, we must have uh, greater cooperation with, you know, Southeast Asian countries also. Particularly, we must in reinvigorate the activities of Bimistek, you know. There's a good, uh, uh, I should say, steps uh, we, we took in the past and that need to be uh, more activated. Thank you. Uh, Governor, coming to Sri Lanka, how does a uh, country uh, like Sri Lanka uh, avoid getting trapped in this uh, fragmentation? And I mean, is there a risk that you have to start choosing sides? How do you avoid that? <laughs> well, that's an uh, interesting question. I think the fragmentation, I, I can, uh, what, uh, what's it, as a small country, I think, in my view, we are the worst affected uh, through fragmentation. For example, now I can I can just start from uh, both sides, externally and also internally. That's the two parts. Externally, uh, the one example I can I cite is that the earliest one, basically, you know, Iran sanctions on Iran by the U.S. Mm -hmm. is one example. We had the only refinery in Sri Lanka that could use Iranian crude oil with the sanctions or so all these things. So we had to stop 
operations and the cost of energy went up uh, as a small country. But we, we also understand the bigger sm strong economies like even India, and South Europe continue to trade with Iran and you know, use petroleum, whereas we affected, uh, worst affected of the small countries like us because we can't uh, do trade settlements because of that. Even now, Russia and Ukraine war, if you look at who has been worst affected, obviously we know India, China, some of the European countries still, you know, import petroleum uh, from Russia, whereas uh, we can't. And as a result, we are paying higher price for petroleum. So this, uh, in our view, country like ours is, is basically affecting more in terms of fragmentation than the bigger, stronger economies. So that, that's uh, the, the distortion that I see in terms of impact, uh, disproportionately affecting countries mm -hmm. like ours. And it's not only that, in terms of uh, internal policies, if you look at Sri Lanka in terms of trade integration, you know, Sri Lanka is one of the first countries in, in, the, in Asia that opened up in 1977. And we, we integrated uh, in terms of trade with, uh, with the region and the world uh, at the beginning uh, for several decades. And then we moved back as a result of uh, Professor Nagesh at this point, you know, internal policies and uh, basically, you know, nationalistic protection policy, we moved back uh, from uh, the open, open small economy into a more, more protectionist uh, closed economy. That's why we have been suffering, uh, uh, the, one of the reasons why we are, we are in the crisis. So that's, that's internal policies, inconsistent internal policies, and moving back and forth. It's also part of the reason, uh, even the external one is something that we hope don't have control. The internal policies, uh, inconsistency is another one that, that has, you know, affected in terms of integration uh, on both sides. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any last thoughts on fragmentation or any other topic? Um, no, not really. I think uh, all I would say is one of the areas which you talked about earlier about structural impediments, I think, I think uh, South Asian region has to find ways of first, while in the world of integra uh, fragmentation has to find ways of integrating itself more than what uh, mm -hmm. It has done so far. That will be a good starting point. And but uh, I have to apologize to my fellow panelists and to Antoinette and to you for rushing out. I have to beat the Friday evening traffic for another engagement. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Yeah. No, no, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. It was a pleasure having you on the panel. Thank you. Governor Adhikari, uh, the same question to you as I asked you. Governor Nandlal here on how do you, from a small yeah. country perspective, how do you see the risks of fragmentation and Thank the risk you. of being caught uh, picking sides? Thank you, Kisnan. Uh, <clears throat> if I remember correctly, the latest IMF report <coughs> outlook of the October 2022 itself is spelled it out that the global uh, this fragmentation is considered as a, one of the challenges, global challenges. So it's a challenge, no doubt at all. <coughs> However, in this world, we cannot imagine that the, anyone or any country can be self-sufficient. So in any way, we have to rely for something with some others. Um, <coughs> for the, either for goods or for services. For the regional basis, as mentioned by the Chief Economic Advisor earlier, definitely it could be uh, improving the pies uh, within the region, so we can consider it as an, as an opportunity. Uh, if you say Nepal, Nepal's case, we'll be happy and fortunate if we can, we can improve our domestic production mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> due to this fragmentation, that would be very much helpful to our economy. Why I'm saying this one is that we have a very peculiar feature of economy uh, with respect to sustainability of our economy, in fact. 
though it's the, though the financial system is very much resilient we can we can see that the, during the covid period also it it helps a lot <coughs> for every recovery but if you see the features we our system is broadly dependent on the remittance basically for foreign exchange reserve and also for the market liquidity at the same time our fiscal is <coughs> mainly dependent revenue is mainly dependent on the import based revenue and the consumption if you see it is highly dependent on import all these created such a such a situation that any time how how we can make our yeah system if the if, if the remittance is um, <coughs> goes dramatically down the the resiliency we cannot we cannot expect we cannot see this growth whatever we are we are gaining so our focus should be towards the domestic production uh, which is which is mostly almost 15% of the food and food related items are imported okay so that that severe condition we were we are handling with so with the support of the IMF, uh, this this ECF and other also guided mods by the by the respective yeah <coughs> people, we are looking forward uh, to have this sort of structural changes, uh, the dependency and the and the remittance from dependency on the remittance to other means of export like hydropower, tourism, agriculture, etc. At the same time. <coughs> the reform and the and the duties tax etc revenue related from from the import based or custom based revenue to the broad based domestic revenues similarly the the consumption should also expected to go the domestic production for all these i think your question is very pertinent to us that this fragmentation would be helpful if we can capture the situation and uh, the reform took place in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Uh, I'm going to change tack and move to a slightly more conjunctural kind of question. So uh, the book talks about macro stability, uh, uh, monetary frameworks, uh, institutional frameworks, and so on. So Governor, from your perspective, how do you see, uh, in the current, given the current conjuncture where we are right now, the challenges uh, the monetary policy framework faces, the challenge for institutions, uh, both from a near-term perspective and from a longer-term perspective, uh, in anchoring uh, strong and inclusive growth. Yeah, thank you. I think this is much more relevant um, uh, um, in terms of Sri Lanka's experiences, especially the institutional, uh, independent institutions, strong institutions, uh, matter a lot. Uh, so just to share uh, uh, my thoughts on the overall macro policy and importance of having strong institutions. Um, for example, now the four, uh, one thing uh, in the presentation in the morning, uh, if you can remember, this is up to, I think, 2020-19 data, the, all the indicators in terms of social indicators, in terms of poverty, in terms of health, education, <coughs> per capita incomes, living standards, the charts only Sri Lanka was kind of outlier, uh, basically better side. But if you look at last two years' data, you can see this complete turnaround. So several decades of uh, the social economic indicators, and I think we were only second to Maldives in terms of some some indicators because small population, a small country, whereas Sri Lanka is relatively higher. This is these are decades of the uh, kind of policies uh, that has led Sri Lanka to basically uh, stand well above the South Asian countries. And the, it highlights the, the lack of strong institutions and some of the mis missteps that basically turn around the decades of good work and move the country back into several decades. For example, in terms of uh, the permanent loss in output. Uh, the, the per capita incomes. More people are now uh, into the poverty line, below the poverty line, compared to the, those charts we were well above. 
So all the indicators, we, we have basically moved several decades back. So what is the reason? This, this key one is basically lack of a strong institution, a strong and independent institution in terms of micro policies. One is, the so key one is what is called imbalances that has been growing several decades and no one basically. So this is one of the reasons why the Sri Lanka's experience, we have gone to the IMF 16 times, this is the 17th time. If you look at the early IMF program, last 10 programs, and look at the objectives, same objectives, revenue-based fiscal <coughs> consolidation and high debt, and what are some payment issues. So we have been going back and forth, and the reason why always with the program we go in the two steps forward and take and again one step backwards, so there's no progress. It's mainly because of the, this important topic of the, the strong fiscal rules, the independent central bank, independent regulatory institutions, strong public service, uh, independent public service, the politicizing the, 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 the whole government operations. Those are the reasons. And as long as, you know, these were basically in a way that uh, one of the reasons why large fiscal deficits moving into large debt, and as long as we had access to markets, we continue to uh, go in this direction. As I said earlier, the negative uh, basically in terms of uh, trade openness, we moved backwards, and then we borrowed and lived for long years. And, and the small mistake and lack of strong institutions that triggered this thing, and we moved back a decade back into the, this thing. I think this is where what is important is now only we are learning that, that you know, important. So that's, that's why I think the Professor Nagishran talked about the India has really, really strong institutions. It's probably that you see consistent, predictable policies. Since 91, they have not gone to that, whereas we have gone to 16 times <laughs> in this. And probably one other country is Pakistan, right? so other than Sri Lanka in the region, has gone like that. And this is where other countries, those who are looking at these things, I think one thing is that this, this basically uh, is, is an important message for all the countries that strong institutions, I think this is an important topic. Uh, is the foundation for a sustainable, inclusive, uh, steady growth for long periods without going into a debt crisis. Certainly now external debt crisis has a huge potential and where supreme crisis, fiscal imbalances, all these things. I think this is where I think I, I all I can share the, our experience. It, it's the test case. And then we can see the, the impact, loss, uh, you know, output loss, for several decades, it will take for us to get back to this position. This is uh, the situation that everyone can learn. Thank you. That was very really poignant, uh, Governor. Uh, Antoinette, if on this point, uh, the Governor made some very telling remarks on how things have slipped back in Sri Lanka. How does, how does a country guard against these slippages in terms of losing fiscal credibility, monetary credibility, institutional credibility, and so on? Uh, I, I know you've been uh, a minister a while ago, but a while ago. But from from your perspective, how do you see this? Uh, uh, how do countries uh, address this problem of slipping? In? No, I I I, I found myself uh, nodding uh, to the comments uh, being made by the governor on the importance of strong institutions. No question that those uh, play a hugely important role in. Uh, uh, in mitigating uh, the impact of uh, uh, tendencies to undo reform and uh, to, to change directions that are very harmful to countries. But I would say that in addition to strong institutions, uh, strong leadership is another piece, a very important piece. Um, on the latter, uh, there's not a lot that the, the fund can contribute, but on the building of institutions, certainly we have a very important role. Uh, in, in the form of our policy advice, but also uh, more uh, importantly, perhaps in the form of uh, the capacity development support we provide uh, to countries to help them build uh, strong uh, institutions. But uh, our finding actually is that uh, the, the actual result of having strong institutions as a result of providing technical assistance and training has a lot to do with uh, ownership mm -hmm. and has a lot to do with strong leadership 
in making sure that when people are trained to do uh, uh, to manage their debt properly, that they have a voice in decisions ar around what debt to contract or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have experiences where uh, the, uh, the fund has invested significantly in, in helping to train officials uh, who have been absolutely ignored when it comes to uh, things that they know more about than those who are making those decisions. So those are uh, aspects of uh, weak institutions as well, <coughs> but also weak leadership. I think, and uh, there's, there's not much that the fund has to do about uh, the issue of uh, uh, weak leadership. Uh, but we can uh, help, uh, uh, certainly, civil society ask harder questions of their leaderships. And we can do that in sharing more information and in being more transparent, helping countries be more transparent about uh, putting out data on how they're managing their budgets, uh, educating parliamentarians uh, about uh, some of the costs of uh, bad policy choices. And uh, our analytic work and our policy advice can be very powerful in, that, uh, in, in, in those circumstances. I know from my own experience that uh, they can, uh, they can uh, uh, very uh, uh, strongly support uh, reformers uh, in wanting to, to, to turn things around. So it, it has to be a combination of uh, the country's own decisions mm -hmm. to take things forward. Uh, enabled by a more educated public uh, that asks harder questions, uh, as well as you know, focused um, uh, capacity development support from institutions like ourselves, which can help countries uh, uh, towards that objective. So I, I would stop there, uh, Krishna, Lovely. on that uh, very uh, important point. Thank you for the very good point, Senator. Uh, Minister, from your perspective, the role of institutions, what can, you, what can countries do to not slip on these on the progress they've already made? I think very pertinent question, uh, particularly having the very good book you know, published today by the fund. All the issues uh, uh, were discussed in detail in this book and using a lot of evidences. And uh, I think quite convincing at uh, this book. I thank the editor and thank the, those who published it. Uh, about institutions, uh, uh, of course, uh, institution is important uh, for growth and development, but institution as such is impersonal, you know. Uh, uh, person who lead the institutions, who work in the institutions, um, uh, is important. Uh, if you have skill, manpower, if you have quality human resource, institutions uh, certainly will do well. So uh, there is very much a good linkage. So to have you know, uh, good uh, institutions, I mean, in, in terms of performance, you need to have quality human resource. That's the basic ingredient. And I think most important ingredient. For that, we need to improve quality of our education. Particularly in Bangladesh, uh, no, in terms of quantity, the educational infrastructures expanded in a big way. We have 104 private universities, around 50 public universities. <coughs> not uh, that was not not that much uh, before 2010. Our literacy level, uh, no, uh, raised very uh, in a very jump in a very big way. It was only 65% uh, literacy in terms of, you know, those who are above 15. So in terms of, uh, no, literacy meaning signing uh, and reading newspapers, books, and uh, having, uh, they can do some calculations some, uh, or some maths they can go with. So literacy rate is 75 in Bangladesh now. It was, uh, no, 10 percentage point higher uh, in a decade. So what I want to say, in terms of uh, no, quantity, uh, our educational uh, system expanded quite. But the big question now is uh, the quality of uh, education. Uh, and uh, for quality people, you need quality education. Then you will have mm, a good institution too. So I think we need to emphasize law. Uh, it says, she said, Antoinette said, Strong leadership is needed. Of course, strong leadership is needed for good governance. For, um, but 
Only strong leadership may not be helpful unless you have quality uh, manpower, quality uh, no people. So <clears throat> I think I, I believe in uh, no. I, I know the importance of institutional economics very much. Uh, those countries <coughs> who uh, did well in the past, they have you know, strong institutions. No doubt about that. So about institutions, I say this is very much related to quality of uh, no, development of human resource. So human, both education and health services, I mean both. And for that, you need quality public spending. So if you have quality public spending, you may not face any debacle. Uh, if you have prudential macroeconomic policies, your economy may not you know, uh, fail. Uh, many countries, even in our region, you know, having higher you know, literacy rate, having you know, uh, expected you know, life expectancies higher, education higher, literacy, I mean, <coughs> and, and per capita income, suddenly, you know, uh, I should say, face the, uh, how I say it, debacle in this you know, COVID situation or after COVID or uh, war in Ukraine. So this is because uh, your higher per capita income, your higher literacy, your higher human quality even may crumble within one or two big uh, mistakes in your macro policies. So it is proven. So I think to have um, no uh, good macro policy, you need uh, well conversed no uh, macro policies with good human quality and uh, for bangladesh i can tell you because of which so many you know dark areas we have no doubt we have no low uh, tax gdp ratio no doubt but in many cases uh, we did well because of our prudential macroeconomy management uh, in overall terms i should say that's why you see in COVID management, that was a big you know, sh uh, shock to the economy. Sudden, uh, we did not see it before. It would be coming. So Bangladesh uh, is the number one country in South Asia in managing the uh, COVID situation. Uh, this is said uh, Nikkei Institute of Japan. So it's not our saying. And uh, it's 15, Bangladesh is 15 uh, world in managing successfully uh, the COVID. So, because our macro policies, our quick intervention with the no, uh, managing the situation, incentive programs involving uh, involving uh, medium, small, medium enterprises, micro enterprises, no agricultural, no peasants, agricultural, no uh, growers, immediately we go with uh, program. That was quite you know uh, timely and thoughtful. So Bangladesh, no, uh, I should say. When many countries in the region also faced negative growth, we had more than 3.5% growth. In the second year of COVID, we grew by, you know, 6.5%. And this year, we are hoping our growth rate would be around somewhere, <coughs> no, more than 7%, I can say. Though IMF you know, uh, prediction is, as I can remember, 6.8%. So it would be more than that because of relatively we have uh, macro policies are uh, well thought out. Uh, though we have gray areas also, I must agree, as I said, low tech GBD ratio. So thank you very much. Thank you. We have about five minutes left for questions. Uh, anyone ask questions from the audience? Yes. <coughs> Uh, very insightful comments. Um, I'd like to ask um, Antoinette or Krishna uh, about uh, what kind of role industrial policy you know, play in spurring this path to resilient growth. Because this industrial policy was started from you know, China, uh, you know, the China made in China 2025, and then also India put forward you know, this make in India. But now what we are witnessing is uh, really it's led by the United States you know, all the made in USA, and also recent, uh, these chips and science act of, you know, $52 billion. And also this IRA, Inflation Reduction Act, 
of the $369 billion. And then also European Union is trying to introduce this industrial policy, their version of this industrial policy. So what we are witnessing as one of uh, also paradigm shift is a really kind of global competition for this industrial policy. So, I mean, according to this, you know, conventional Washington con consensus, there was reservation on this role of industrial policy. So how you see uh, this, you know, in this changed world, the role of industrial policy? For you? Yeah. I can, I can if you want. Uh, I, would, I would say that uh, you know, uh, looking, uh, one has to look at the details, of course, uh, because uh, one, uh, one can characterize uh, industrial policy in different ways. I mean, people uh, understand them differently. But certainly our view that uh, they, uh, they are not uh, the best contributors uh, to, uh, to maximizing uh, the benefits from uh, open trade, for example, have not changed and that the protectionist measures that some countries are uh, putting in place now uh, uh, justified in, in very different ways in different places uh, are, are subject to the same limits in terms of what they think they can achieve for themselves and certainly the, the adverse impact that they can uh, cause to others. Uh, so I would, I would not uh, uh, say that the world has changed in such a way that uh, the, the drawbacks uh, from industrial policy look very different today than they did uh, before the pandemic and before the war in Ukraine uh, as well. Yes, yes please. I just uh, no, comment on Washington consensus as you referred to. Uh, Actually, as I remember, it was announced in uh, 1989, Washington Consensus. After IMF's you know, structural framework, then came in uh, Washington Consensus. So Bangladesh followed, particularly our only government, my government now, uh, where I am the cabinet minister, uh, state minister. So we followed Washington Plus, why I say so? Because Washington consensus, you know, I emphasized uh, liberalization, you know, no, uh, uh, minimizing the budget deficit, you know, all this. So having all this in the 90s, Aumili government second time came in power uh, after 15 years in 1996. Then we follow Washington concept plus. Why I say plus? Because we incorporated that with the principles of Washington Consensus, plus uh, emphasizing social welfare, plus emphasizing competition among the, uh, among, uh, among the uh, businesses, as much as possible encouraging you know, competition, particularly in the telecommunications sector. So Bangladesh uh, rightly you know, uh, captured the spirit of Washington Consensus, plus we emphasized uh, social welfare, emphasized more on agriculture, we provided subsidies hugely, that yielded huge result in the 1999-2000. Uh, for the first time, we attained f uh, food autarky. So thank you very much. Uh, any other question? Yes, the back. Not questions, actually, a couple of thoughts. Um, when you look at the title of this high-level policy roundtable, we are not paying much attention to resilience. I think that is particularly important because what we are facing now, COVID itself was a shock and countries exhibited resilience. If you take more re recent example, in March of last year, India was promoting exporting wheat. They had 60 million tons or so in the warehouses. Officially wanted to export. Then March became one of the hottest year in 100 years. And the crop forecast changed. Immediately there was a ban on export. And that had ripple effect, shock wave to the global food market. So these are serious issues. 
how do we tackle those issues in terms of building an institution and how can fund help in those kind of investment? That's my first comment. I think it's just food for thought. Uh, second, uh, Honorable Minister's point, uh, Professor Alam's point, that the BIMSTEC can be a framework. I heard about it in the previous session as well. We have been trying to work with BIMSTEC. As an institution, this is the Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multisectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation. Very mouthful. So um, their institutional capacity is not that strong. Potentials are there. It, this can be a fantastic platform for regional integration. Uh, it can be a platform to cooperate with ASEAN, for example. As you, most of you know, South Asian countries do less trade within themselves than they do with ASEAN countries. So why? I mean, you ask the question, why? Why should that be the case? Uh, it's essentially the going back to the fundamentals of the policies, uniform you know, policies. There is a fragmentation at that level as well. Let me give you an example. Agricultural machinery import to India, I think, if I'm not mistaken, import duty is 30%. For Bangladesh, it's 3.5%. So it's very different. As a result, despite being a lower level, mechanization level in Bangladesh is, is I think, highest in South Asia because of the policy. These are clearly policy impact. Um, I had one more thought, but I skipped it. So thank you so much. It's evening. <laughs> thank you for those wonderful thoughts. Uh, yeah, please. Antoinette. No, thank you for those thoughts. And uh, I, I wanted to come back to the first uh, comment you made and uh, beg to differ uh, a little on your conclusion that the panel has not paid much attention to resilience. Uh, I think uh, there's one aspect of resilience that we've talked about quite a bit and that is to do with uh, you know, the making a macroeconomic policy more effective and institutions stronger uh, to help countries uh, you know, deal with shocks, unanticipated shocks. That's a big part of resilience. I think what we have not talked about enough uh, so far is the issue of, cl of climate, of course, and uh, resilience uh, to, to climate shocks. And the fund has absolutely been, been paying huge attention to this issue, as you would have seen across the board from uh, the analytic work we're doing, the, the, the focus on climate issues in our uh, surveillance work, in our Article 4 reports, um, the development of the first long-term financing instrument uh, at the fund, the Resilience and Sustainability Trust, to provide financing to not just our low-income country members, but our middle-income countries as well, uh, that uh, uh, need to support in addressing uh, climate challenges. Um, and we're, uh, we've rolled out uh, a few of those uh, uh, pieces of support already to pilot countries. Bangladesh will be the next on the 30th of January. <laughs> uh, and we're very much looking forward to, to supporting a country that has done quite a bit already in that, uh, in that area and that needs further support to take it forward. But you, uh, you're right that we have not uh, discussed that enough on, on the panel so far. But uh, I just wanted to add that uh, resilience has several dimensions, and the one that we, we have talked about quite a bit is this former one I described. Thank you. <laughs> of course, of course, understood. Thank you. Actually, I do apologize because that was a question I was going to ask, but we ran out of time. On climate, we have done a lot of work. Uh, in fact, uh, we have a paper coming out very soon which looks at you know, the whole issue of resilience, climate risks, and so on, from the point of view of, of the public perception. How does the public perceive the risks from climate change? Uh, how do the public see the trade-offs and policies, and so on and so forth? And so we've done a lot of work on resilience building in the context of climate. But again, we ran out of time, so I, I do apologize for that. But uh, we have one minute. Any last question before I try to sum? Yes. Uh, decoupling could well be an uh, issue, or maybe as, as the countries are actually looking at uh, decoupling from China, do you see it as a growth uh, um, uh, or an impediment to growth? Thank you. 
So again, we've done some work on decoupling. And, and the, the thing is, any kind of thing, whether it's decoupling or fragmentation, the losses are significant. And again, you know, when you try to barter away efficiency gains from other, for other kind of gains, uh, nobody wins. So that's some of the work we have done. Uh, we've done specific work on technological decoupling, which was a point raised uh, a while ago. Again, the losses are quite a lot. Everybody loses in this. So there are, you know, short-term risks uh, coming from China, and uh, you know, but we should put this in a broader perspective. You know, China has been an important player in uh, global value chains. Has been important uh, value, uh, important factor in greater trade integration and so on. So there could be, you know, some short-term risks from uh, what's happening in China right now, and people kind of magnify that. But you should not uh, throw the baby with the bathwater. And so in that sense, I think it's important to recognize that any kind of uh, decoupling, fragmentation, uh, or, or nearshoring, things like that, have costs which are quite significant. And Asia in particular will lose a lot more. That's what our work has shown. That, that's because Asia has been a more, more integrated region than the rest of the world. So the, the, the risks from this are much higher for Asia. I don't know if you, anybody wants to add, Antony, you want to add anything on that, but. OK, I think we're out of time here. But we had a good discussion today. We talked about some aspects where clearly are, uh, there are winners on digitalization, where India has done remarkable work. And that could be a, a way to, for other countries to, to follow. Uh, there are benefits there uh, in terms of how we see uh, uh, anchoring strong and sustainable growth post-pandemic. We talked about the risks of uh, geoeconomic fragmentation, and there was broad agreement that the risks are significantly high, and the world should move towards greater integration. Of course, public policy needs to do a better job of trying to highlight what are the ro losses and gains, and in some sense, make sure that the losers don't lose much, and so you compensate that. So there's a role for public policy there. Uh, there was a whole issue of resilience and uh, you know, the role of institutions in, in anchoring strong macro management and I think the governor made some very important points saying how one needs to guard against the risks of slipping from the progress you've made. I think, um, uh, you know, governor, you made a very, very important point. I think it's an important lesson for every country so that if you, you consolidate your gains and you move forward, you don't slip back. I think the role of institutions there is extremely critical, whether it's macro, whether it's fiscal or monetary. Uh, Antony, you made a very important point about the role of leadership. And again, that goes to the point, again, leadership and ownership. When the governor said you've had 16 programs with the IMF, why will the 17th program be more successful? Again, it all speaks to the fact that any kind of reform effort should be owned, and leadership is very important. Uh, we talked about uh, transparency. And again, the minister talked about importance of education and skill levels, uh, which can anchor uh, many of the things, whether it's leadership or ownership. And finally, quality of public spending. Uh, which, again, was an important factor. We didn't touch upon climate change, but believe me, we are doing a lot of work on that. Uh, and the RST, which uh, Anthony talked about, is a truly an innovative instrument from the IMF. It's a long, um, uh, it's the longest in terms of tenure, 20 years, 10 and a half years grace. Uh, it addresses the issue of climate change and pandemic preparedness. And it's also an important uh, uh, a tool to catalyze financing, not just from the public sector and from other IFIs, but mainly from the private sector to address the, the, the problem of, with the risks of climate change. So we had a very good discussion. I'd like to thank our panelists, Mr. Nagesh, to leave early. But thank you, Governor. Uh, thank you, Governor Adhikari. Uh, thank you, Minister. And thank you, Antoinette, so much for your time and for being here. And thank you all. Thank you.